Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I will be reviewing HyperDot. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO83. All right, what is HyperDot? HyperDot is a video game uh, by local game developer Charles McGregor. Um, He actually graduated from uh, Harding High School back in 2012, and so it was uh, pretty easy for me to convince him to come and hang out with uh, Harding's game club after school one Thursday. Uh, So that was a a lot of fun. Uh, The kids got to play the game, and um, and I got to chat with Charles for a while about uh, about what that process was like. Hyperdot is available on Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and Xbox platforms currently. So each level consists of a circular arena. Um, you've got a little dot that you are controlling that moves around inside that a- arena. And enemies spawn around the edges of the circle, and then they travel inwards uh, towards you, and you just have to dodge all of them um there's like three different game modes that you can play um either survival which is where you have to survive for as long as you can uh collect which is where tokens kind of randomly spawn throughout the arena and you have to go over and uh, grab them uh or area which is where um a a little circular area uh kind of spawns in a random location uh in the in the arena and you have to stay within that area in order to um you know get credit for for the amount of time that you're uh, in that area in addition to those different goals that are built into the gameplay there's also uh multiple different kind of modes that you can um play so you can either like play the campaign which is a series of pre-made levels uh each one with a particular goal um i believe that there's a hundred levels in the campaign uh you can play custom levels so there is a level editor and you can make your own levels and then uh, and then play those uh, free play is uh, a series of pre-made levels um, where instead of like going for a particular goal, like so in the campaign, right, you might be playing a game or a level where you have to uh, survive for 15 seconds while, you know, a series of obstacles come your way um, in free play. Uh, those like you might see those same obstacles coming at you, but uh, instead of having to survive for 15 seconds you just survive for as long as you can and then you get a high score based on how well you did there Uh, and then there's also a multiplayer aspect Uh, i believe this is only local multiplayer um and uh, it it works just like free play you go for as long as everybody survives um but you have multiple players on the field and so everybody gets kind of credit for uh how well they do um versus everybody else who's on the field There's a few different types of enemies in this game. Uh, So squares are the most basic ones. They travel in a straight line across the diameter of the arena. Pentagons uh, travel also in a straight line, just like squares, but instead of going straight across the arena, the direction that they travel is determined by where your dot is when that particular pentagon spawns. So wherever you happen to be at the moment, um, the pentagon will travel from where it spawns towards where you currently are. Um, but it doesn't change its direction after it spawned, so um, they, you know, they're not homing missiles. The triangles, however, are homing missiles. And golly, do I hate the triangles. They always throw off my groove whenever I've, like think that I've kind of figured out how to really, you know, do a particular level uh, and then triangles are introduced into the mix, like, oh, it just throws everything off. Stars are kind of weird. They, like, travel in one direction for a moment and then they pause and then they change and move in a different direction for a moment. So they're always traveling in a straight line, um, but the direction that they're that they're moving changes uh as they spend more time in the arena and the stars are always kind of like the 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 new direction that they choose is always trying to go towards where the player is and then the final enemy type is crosses Um, so crosses travel in a straight line for a little while and then they stop and they like spin around a bunch and then they disappear while shooting out four smaller squares from each arm of the cross 
There are a few different level modifiers that uh, you can activate. Um, so a level that has dark mode turned on, uh, it works where like you can't see the entire level. You just kind of have this this glow, this light that's emanating from your dot, and then uh, you can see. So you can see the the enemies that are like closest to you. Um, ice levels, uh, you will kind of like. If you, if you start moving your dot in a particular direction, it'll, like, continue sliding in that direction if you let go of the joystick. Um, and, and so, the oh, man, I'm really bad at ice levels. Oh, I hate them. Uh, and then Super Dot, that's a fun one. Um, I assume that it's named after Super Hot because... Uh, what happens is the enemies only move, well, they move very, very slowly when you're not moving, but then they move at their normal speed when you move your dot. Um, so it, it really, it kind of gives you a more cerebral, you know, you're able to kind of plan out your moves a little bit more in this super dot um, mode. The interesting thing is that, like, this this kind of slow motion um, setting doesn't affect anything else that's on the board. So, like, if you are uh, in... Super, if, if the Super Dot modifier is, is on and your goal is to uh, collect tokens, the tokens will uh, spawn and, the you know, the timers for each token before that token disappears, those timers are still going at the normal speed that they, that they usually do. There are a few power-ups. Um, armor is, uh, well, I mean, it basically just gives you a shield. It's, it's like an extra life, right? If you uh, hit an enemy while you have, uh, after you've collected an armor power-up, then uh, you don't die right away, but you lose your armor. Uh, clear power-ups, uh, those will kind of clear all the enemies that are within a particular radi radius of where you currently are. Uh, slow will just... Uh, make everything go in slow motion for a little while uh, and then bomb will um, kind of like after you hit it um, it'll kind of tick down you know for a particular timer and then it explodes and if a player is uh, caught within that radius then uh, then, then they'll die they'll lose um, and I, I'm pretty sure that bombs only appear in multiplayer uh, because there would be like no reason in single player for you to go after a power-up that might kill you and doesn't really kill anything else. And then there's also um, a reverse power-up, but I haven't seen that yet. I've made it through about 50 levels uh, in the campaign, and I don't think I've seen reverse yet, so we'll find out. Um, a quick note about the uh, control scheme for this game. Um, so... Charles, like, very specifically went out of his way to make sure that he was uh, supporting a wide variety of different input devices, right? It works with mouse and keyboard, it works with controllers, it um, works with, like, a lot of different accessibility uh, devices. Um, I definitely recommend playing it with a controller instead of mouse and keyboard, or at least... I recommend a controller instead of using the mouse because um, when you're, you know, the, the the movement of your mouse is not going to be a one-to-one -one relationship to how fast the dot moves, right? Your dot always will move. It has a maximum uh, speed that it moves at, and so like using a controller just feels more natural because um, you just push the the joystick to you know to the maximum that you can and then your dot will be moving at the maximum speed that it can whereas with a mouse um you're just kind of moving a cursor around on the screen and then the dot is just you know moving towards that cursor at whatever its maximum speed is so for level design um having a level editor in the game by the way um really kind of gives it helped to give me a better sense of like how the uh, level design process worked for for this game um so there's kind of there's two different types of levels really that like from from a design perspective um some of the levels were kind of more designed in a in a like wave based system where it's just like um it's semi random uh where like a, a particular number of enemies are set to enter the field at 
different times, uh, but the direction, the exact you know places where those enemies are going to spawn are randomly selected by the game as it's running. Um, but then there are other levels where like the uh, um, where Charles has put like very specific patterns of uh enemy waves into the game where like it kind of guides you through like you have to uh travel in a particular pattern a particular direction in order to survive um and i really really like those types of levels because like it really reminds me of like super hexagon or duet which are um two other games that i've really really enjoyed in this like kind of subgenre of dodge everything gameplay it's also really cool to see a game where, like, the the number of different elements that go into making this game, right, uh, is a very small list, right? I just listed all of the types of enemies and all of the different, like, level modifiers, etc. Um, I listed all of that in under 10 minutes just now. Um, but, you know, you can combine all these things in um, an infinite number of different ways to make different types of levels and uh, different challenges and stuff. And... Uh, and so, yeah, like I, I love that kind of emergent property of, uh, of game design. The soundtrack for the game was also composed by Charles. Um, I would describe it as like a super chill house music. I don't know if house music is exactly the right phrase for that. I don't have great vocabulary for talking about music, but you know, it's 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 just uh, it's music that's not going to get in your way. It's not going to distract you. Um, it's just you know, kind of chill out, relax music. Um, as, uh, as my wife Savannah said to me while I was playing this on the TV, she was like, how are you not f falling asleep right now? Um, and I guess, I mean, really the only thing that was keeping me awake at that point was probably the fact that I was engaged in this game and trying to stay alive. I will note that the like beat of the music doesn't really line up with the player's actions in the game, um, unlike in Duet or Super Hexagon, um, because there really isn't like a set rhythm of mo movement that you have to follow in the game in order to uh, survive. Whereas, um, in, yeah, in those other two games, like you're only moving left or right you're only tapping in one of two directions and so the the level designers were able to kind of very precisely calibrate the the challenges that are coming towards you so that you have to push those two buttons uh at the correct times and they can kind of line those up with like the beats of the songs that they know are going to be playing in the game um whereas in hyperdot you know you've got kind of this entire two-dimensional plane where you might be moving around and because the like the the obstacles that are coming towards you are like semi-randomly spawned and they might be moving in different directions depending on where you go um right like that that kind of synchronization between the soundtrack and the gameplay uh isn't really possible uh one nice thing that i discovered in the uh in the menu is that uh, you can actually select which tracks from the soundtrack uh, play during the game. So if you find a track that you you know really don't like, uh, you can just turn that one off in in the in the in the menu. The visuals in this game, oh man, I really dig them. They are abstract. They're everything is like easy to distinguish um, between the different objects on the field. Um, also, I, b I believe that there's like a, a plethora of different like color settings that you can uh, use in the game for accessibility reasons. I think my favorite visual effect in the game is the like shadow effects when you are in a dark arena um, because like the the glow that's emanating from your dot right then you can see all of the um, enemies that are nearby but then there's like this shadow that kind of you know that emanates that that um, those enemies that are nearby are blocking the light and so you kind of get this like radial effect of uh, of darkness kind of traveling outwards from those enemies um, and blocking your view of any other enemies that might be like right behind them. 
One thing that I do think could be improved on the uh, visual front is the um, the timer that um, plays when you are like in uh, survival levels um, is really hard to keep track of because it's just you know it's it's numbers that are ticking down um, and those numbers are like outside of the arena um, and so like in order for for me for my brain to process how much time I have left I have to actually like look away from the arena look at these digits and then you know turn that into okay I understand how much time is left um, I think it would be much easier for the player to to keep track of like that if it were visualized as like you know the if your dot became a circle that was like filling up um, as as time went on um, which is a, a visual effect that is in the game they like they use that uh, in the area levels um, to kind of visualize how much more time you have to stay in the target area in order to reach your goal um, I think that that should be replicated in the uh, survival levels as well now thinking about this game and the fact that like I have been very closely comparing it to like Super Hexagon and Duet, which are both games that um, I played originally on um, on my phone, uh, and then I think I also got like the desktop versions of them just to you know get more Steam achievements or whatever. Um, I think that that Hyperdot would really work well on mobile platforms because it's like um, each one of the rounds is, is really short. Um, the only like kind of drawback that I can think of is that it's, you know, since you don't have a, a joystick directly built into most phones, right? You know, you're going to be kind of emulating this joystick input on a, uh, on a touch screen, um, which, which, isn't as bad as like using a mouse, I would think, but um, it, it isn't quite as good as like using an, of an actual physical joystick. Um, but other than that little, little, you know, input hiccup, um, I think that this game would really work on uh, mobile devices. I think it, it could really shine there. Um, and I know that Charles knows that as well. And I'll probably grab a copy on Android if it ever comes out. And that reminds me, uh, one of the things that I really, really appreciate about uh, this game is actually um, not within the game itself, but like the business practices outside of the game. Uh, so it's obviously available like on Xbox or the Xbox Store. It's also available on Steam, um, but they also released it on Itch. And the if you buy it through Itch, you get um, not only a Steam key to activate it over there, but also you get like the DRM-free uh, versions for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Um, and beyond that, it doesn't even like require it's it's not like an installer right and so you don't need um, admin privileges to install it on a computer you just run the exe and uh, and it plays the game which is great for game club over at Harding because we don't have administrator privileges on any of the computers in my classroom um, but we can still fire up uh, Hyperdot and uh, get that going like up on the projector and have a bunch of uh, students playing multiplayer together and it's a good time. So I'm very hopeful that uh, if it does come out on like Android that uh, that I'll they'll be uh, releasing the DRM free like APK versions of it as well. That would be really nifty. All right, so final thoughts. Um, yeah, this is a game that uh, really like respects your time on an individual, you know, level by level basis. Um, you don't have to spend very much time with it uh, at any, you know, in any given session. But um, you know, it's still a game that you can like spend a lot of time with over the course of weeks and months um, because like there is a lot of depth that you know when you start combining all these different. Uh, gameplay elements and um, and you know it can take a while to really master your technique for for surviving for a long time in a lot of these levels um, so I think I'm definitely going to be enjoying uh, continuing through like the campaign and trying to um, increase my my high scores uh, in the freestyle or the free play uh, category um, I think I really would like to be able to compare like my high scores with friends or even, you know, with a global leaderboard kind of thing. Um, so that would be uh, a cool thing for, for Charles to implement in the game as well. 
And I know that I have at least one student at Harding who uh, would appreciate that feature as well because uh, he keeps bugging me during class, asking me how many levels I've completed in the campaign. So, yeah, I've completed about 50 levels, Landon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Second Opinion Reviews, everybody. Uh, I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. This episode is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to uh, use any part of it as you see fit, as long as you link back to the original page, which once again is thenexus.tv slash SO83. If you want to discuss this episode with other listeners, maybe you have played Hyperdot and you have thoughts about it, uh, you can join us on our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash TV. And if you are willing and able to help us out financially as we continue to make technology-focused podcasts, you can join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash TV. Speaking of Patreon, four weeks ago, after the uh, Google Nest Mini review, uh, I announced that we were going to have a drawing for all of our patrons uh, to see who gets to take home the uh, Google Nest Mini that I uh, tested and reviewed in that episode. And today is the day that we announce who won. So... After uh, inputting our list into random.org and uh, having it select a winner, the Google Nest Mini will be going to... Quentin Pongratz. Thanks, Quentin, for uh, your support on Patreon. It means a lot to us. Thanks for listening, and until next time, have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence. Technology is ever evolving. It touches every part of our lives, both influencing and being influenced by society. I'm Ian Arbuck, and I know it's hard to stay on top of everything you need to know to live in this digital world. That's why every month on the Extra Dimension, we explore a different aspect of the technological convergence. Find it on our website, thenexus.tv, or by searching for The Extra Dimension in your favorite podcast player.